the state of the relationship can be described by the statements coming out of the U.S. government, practically on a daily basis, in which they commit to punish Cuba, to take economic coercive measures against Cuba, to damage our economy, to try to discredit Cuba, and to accuse us of many things, among them that we are a threat to the security in the region. So the only way to describe the relationship, it's a hostile one today from the government of the United States. It has always been, a, the relationship between Cuba and the United States has, al has always been difficult. There has been an incapacity or a failure in the U.S. government to accept the fact that Cuban nation uh, is determined to defend its right to, to self-determination and to have a sovereign state. And that failure has led consecutive governments in the United States to practice hostility against our government. Today's uh, situation is similar to previous periods. The difference is that today the level of engagement, the level of mutual knowledge, the level of interest between Cubans and Americans and between Cubans in the country and Cubans who live in the United States is much greater. There's much greater contact than there was in the past. So in spite of the hostility, there's much better contact between the people of the United States and the people of Cuba. It's, um, it's a reflection of the sentiments of both our peoples. It's a reflection of the sentiment of the majority of Americans and of the majority of Cuban Americans. But also it shows uh, the failure of the United States in spite of spending on a yearly basis roughly $40 million US dollars from taxpayers to try to discredit Cuba and to try to demonize Cuba. In spite of that, the interest in the United States and the level of contact has grown during the past few years. Yeah, during 2015 and 2016, there was without doubt a, a movement from both our governments towards a better understanding. It doesn't mean that we solved our contradictions. We were far from saying that we were normalizing our relations. You have to understand that the, the economic blockade was still in place. The United States continued to, to occupy a piece of Cuban territory. So we were far from thinking that we were normalizing our relations. But we're in a path towards a better understanding to try to deal with our differences in a civilized and a respectful manner. And we were able uh, mutually to work to establish the pillars of what could be a constructive relationship for the future. And that was important. It allowed a lot of exchange between our countries. It allowed, allowed many Americans to come into touch with Cuba for the first time, to engage with a country in cultural, artistic, scientific, educational, health, environmental exchanges. And that helped uh, for us to have a better knowledge a better understanding between the two countries. That is difficult to erase in spite of the current climate between the two countries, in spite of the current commitment of the government of Donald Trump towards to have hostility uh, with Cuba. It did. It, it had a positive impact because some of the uh, restrictions, some of the limitations, some of the punishments of the economic blockade were eased and there wasn't the, the level of pressure that th there is today. You have to understand that the impact of the economic blockade in Cuba just in 2018 was around four billion dollars. Imagine to the, to the, the impact for an economy of the size of Cuba to have on a yearly basis an impact of sanctions that implies over four billion dollars. That can give you an indication of what could have been the growth of the Cuban economy if the economic blockade were not to exist. During the Obama years, during the end of the Obama years, there was an easing on some of the measures of the blockade, but the blockade remained in place. The, the financial uh, limitations were there. The persecution of Cuban transactions all over the world continued. Uh, travel was still highly restricted. We could not do any transaction in U.S. dollars, nor we could, or could we make deposits in the United States 
nor could we obtain credits in the United States or finance trade between our two countries. So the limitations were there with a huge negative impact on Cuba, but it was much better than the situation that we had just a few years before. I would need many words to, to describe my opinions about Helmsburg. Uh, uh, most people in the U.S. don't know about this law. Many politicians don't know about this law. It's a very lengthy, very comprehensive, very complex law. It's a very peculiar piece of legislation because the U.S. doesn't have a similar legislation uh, regarding any other issue of foreign policy, Re regarding any other country. It is difficult to think that Cuba is the most important issue of U.S. strategic and international affairs. And yet there's this very complex, lengthy, complex law, very comprehensive, regarding specifically Cuba. It's a law that calls for the international sanctions against Cuba. It calls for the, the international community to punish Cuba economically as the U.S. punishes us unilaterally, something that is rejected by the international community. It tries to scare away foreign investors from coming to Cuba to, to, to try to Im uh, prevent our country from receiving capital that any developing country needs for its development. But also, this law establishes like a blueprint, a very detailed blueprint of what would be the future of Cuba once the constitutional government of Cuba is defeated. And it's a colonial recipe. It establishes, among other things, that once that objective is, is achieved of defeating the current, overthrowing the current government of Cuba. In other words, after achieving regime change in Cuba, the, the US government would designate an American as an administrator of Cuba, as if we were a defeated colonial territory in a colonial war. That administrator would be in charge of guiding and steering the changes that need to occur in Cuba for Cuba as a nation to be acceptable to the United States. That could be one year, two years, 10 years of a transition period with a U.S. citizen governing Cuba, regardless of what the people of Cuba think. It's a determination of the U.S. government. Once the government of the United States has reported to Congress that the conditions of transition are met, then the U.S. government will allow Cubans to have an election, an election to be monitored by them, and then a government will be elected that, if verified by the U.S. government, will be accepted as a legitimate government of Cuba. Among other things, during that period, Cuba would have to return to Americans and to non-Americans any property that was used or nationalized in Cuba legitimately during the past 60 years. And only then, it could be 10 years, 15 years, it could take 30 years to return or to pay for that property. Only then would the economic blockade, as we know it today, be lifted. So you can understand what could be the feelings, not of, of a Cuban diplomat, but of a common Cuban citizen about this law that a group of politicians in the United States concede and are implementing, unfortunately, as they say, on behalf of Americans as a whole. It, we will never be able to measure the impact of Title III. Title III is in force since 1996. What's being implemented now is a possibility to, to take action in court if demands are presented. But the title as such and its purpose is being implemented since 96. We will never be able to, to gauge what has been the impact because we will not know how many entrepreneurs, how many investors decided not to come to Cuba or cancel the negotiation because of fear of the consequences it could suffer in the United States. And therefore, we cannot measure it today, we could not measure in the past, and we will never know which will be the real impact of it. But we do know that it does serve a purpose of intimidation. It's, it's like the mafia. It's intimidating. You, you, you try to step in Cuba and we will punish you. Those are uh, pro projects guided a regime change. In other words,
to try to induce in Cuba the changes that the people of Cuba, the majority of Cubans, do not want, are not requesting, are not inviting anyone for those projects to exist. So it's a unilateral imposition of the U.S. government to try to interfere in the domestic affairs of Cuba. The same type of interference that the U.S. government as a whole, both parties, complain when they see another nation or when they claim that another nation is interfering in the U.S. elections or in U.S. Uh, political affairs. Well, that's what they've been trying to do in Cuba for the past 60 years. And they've spent billions of dollars, billions of dollars, in trying to achieve regime change in Cuba against the will of the people of Cuba. They have not achieved their goal for many reasons. The first one is that they're not welcome by the people of Cuba. So they might find a few people that they pay, out, that they pay off that would accept, but it will go nowhere. Uh, some of the money goes into the pockets of people that are making a living out of this in the United States and in Cuba. People who make a living out of requesting USAID to put money in place so, so that theoretically they could have a regime change or a transition to some kind of society that Cubans don't want, but it doesn't occur. The impact has been no and it will continue to be in the future. Of course, we do not allow them, we do not welcome them, and we have the rights and we have the legislation in place to stop these programs to occur. Evidently, we don't, because anyone in Cuba can have internet. Any citizen, any foreigner, anyone in Cuba can have it. So evidently, we do not fear. What we do not accept is for others to try to organize our country. There are many governments in the world that allow the commercialization of alcohol. But in many countries, it's a government monopoly, or a provincial monopoly, or a state monopoly. They do it, but they don't allow others to do it, is their legislation. In Cuba, we organize communications in the way that we conceive it should be. It was not for Alan Gross or for the U.S. government or for anyone to try to organize communications, telecommunications, internet, in the way that the U.S. feels it should be. It's a Cuban issue. It should be organized and executed in Cuba in the way that Cubans feel. The breakthroughs have been that the scientific community as a majority, has put in question all the theories that have been managed. And the majority of them, the most serious, have said that none of the allegations made by the Department of State, by some of the congressmen, and by some of the people that have spoken, are true. You, you have to recall that they went from sonic attacks to a biological situation, to a viral one, to electroacoustic uh, damage to the brain, to brain concussions having occurred without a concussion, to ultrasound, microsound, infrasound weapons, to microwave weapons. All of them have been dismissed by the scientific community. The problem is that all this was carried by the media. One day, an American official would say, as they say now, it's true that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. One will say, it's true. That, that didn't happen, but it doesn't matter. The damage was caused, which was a purpose of the whole campaign. The accusations were put in place, and they have been successful in putting in the minds of people that something occurred in Cuba against American diplomats. And unfortunately, to some extent, the media has been complicit in that because it's a sexy story. It sounds like a mysterious suspense situation, and they have carried out without checking mo many of the things that, uh, that have been said. And some journalists have even, have even gone further in trying to portray uh, cons international conspiracies in this whole issue, none of which has been substantiated. The truth, of the truth of the matter is that till today, there's no evidence even that people were sick. And we are very careful. We don't question that anyone was ill. Well, we have received no evidence whatsoever. We have not had access to medical records. We have not had access to the doctors that have spoken with the people that reported illness. We, of course, have not had any access to the people that reported illness. So even if they may be ill, and again, we don't question that, we have no real evidence that that occurred. 
Um, of course, there's no evidence whatsoever of any acoustic weapon in Cuba or the existence of an acoustic weapon in the way that is described by the different allegations. There's no evidence of the existence of a microwave weapon capable of doing what has been described by some of the people that have spoken about this, including some with scientific background. And there's no proof whatsoever that in over 60 years, the government of Cuba has taken any step to damage or to, to damage or to punish any diplomat, American or non-American, in this country. And the fact is that we are visited by 1.5, one, I don't know how many million, uh, 4 million, over 4 million people visit Cuba every year. And there's no evidence that any of them has fallen sick. So it's very difficult to portray a story that you can target th through any of these means an individual and obtain a, an impact in the way that has been described. I haven't said so, but many have, and I have no reason to doubt it. it it's two different things related. The future of Cuba and the future of U.S.-Cuba uh, relations. In Cuba, what's, what's convening most of the energy of the government, in the time of the government at, at the moment, is to try to pursue the transformations that we have committed to in order to make uh, our society uh, improve, uh, to strengthen socialism as we conceive it, prosperous, uh, sustainable, uh, democratic, and for the benefit of the population as a whole, based on solidarity, not on greed, not on selfishness. That is what is uh, convening today the energy and the attention uh, mostly of the government. Of course, the relationship is important for us because the number one obstacle for Cuba's development is the economic blockade applied by the U.S. for the past 60 years. And it would be naive today to think, at least with the current government, that that is going to change. So we need to work around the U.S. economic blockade and plan our development in spite of the punishment of the economic coercive measures that are contained in the economic blockade, in spite of the fact that its non-existence would be an important push for the development of Cuba. As we hope, and, uh, and we know what we know is the correct word, that the tendency, the trend towards the future is for more Americans, or the majority of Americans, uh, their sentiments to grow in favor of our relationship with Cuba as we also know that the trend among Cuban Americans is for a better relationship with their country of origin, for a better engagement, more contact and communication with their country of origin. That is a long-term trend. We are forced to be patient. It is not our choice, but we're forced to be patient and, and see when there is a government in the United States or when if this government is ready to engage respectfully in a civilized manner with Cuba. Whenever they're ready, we are ready to talk, we're ready to engage. But what we're not ready to do is to compromise the sovereignty of our nation, our right to self-determination, or the path for the future of our country that we have chosen.